This is Cathy Bogan for Consortium News coming from Sydney, Australia, and I'm just about to head off to Canberra to report on the sentencing of David McBride, a former military lawyer who was charged with stealing government documents and giving them to journalists to reveal covered up murders of unarmed civilians by Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. McBride's defence had rested on the court accepting his argument that he had a duty to do so, beyond obedience to military orders. But the trial judge, Justice David Mossop, said he would instruct the jury to disregard any public interest in the defence. Quote, there is no aspect of duty that allows the accused to act in the public interest contrary to a lawful order, he told the court. McBride's legal team tried to appeal that decision, but the application was denied by the Supreme Court Chief Justice Lucy McCallum. Then agents of the Attorney General's office removed classified documents from the defence's possession, which McBride's team had intended to present to the jury. This effectively left David with no real alternative but to plead guilty, and he appeared last week for sentencing, half expecting to be led off to prison. But after a full day of hearing arguments on how McBride should be dealt with, Justice Mossop deferred his decision for a week, and we are back in court on May 14th to learn of his fate. Is the only duty of a legal officer to follow lawful orders, even if it means remaining silent about serious misconduct? Why did the defence focus on the question of McBride's duty? I've been reporting live from the courtroom throughout these hearings alongside lawyer Eddie Lloyd, who is with me today. And Eddie remains convinced that McBride's paramount duty was to the court over and above his duty as a soldier. Eddie, there is obviously a legal as well as an ethical reason why McBride was duty bound to blow the whistle on serious misconduct. Can you tell us why? Is this duty legislated? Yes, it is legislated. And when one becomes a lawyer and is admitted to a jurisdiction within Australia, one is also bound by these legislated duties. It's actually a law uh, in place. They're professional duties that lawyers must comply with. Uh, and David was, of course, admitted to a jurisdiction of um, the Supreme Court in Australia, and that was a prerequisite for him to get the job as a military lawyer. He had to be admitted. And so part of that admission is that you have these legislated duties. And the most important duty is, and they call it, it's legislated as the paramount duty of a lawyer is to the court and to ensure the efficient and proper administration of justice. And that's in a regulation three of the legal professional uniform law, which is across every jurisdiction of Australia. And it goes even further than that. And this is why it's on so relevant to David's case is, yes, the duty is the paramount duty and it prevails to the extent of inconsistency of any other duty, i.e., a soldier's duty to obey. And that's where we see in David's case, unfortunately, this very, very old and ancient tradition of legal duty has kind of been thrown out the back door in a Nuremberg's kind of way where no longer really is a lawyer's duty to the court and the efficient administration of justice if you're a soldier, for example, which beggars the question, why did he need a law degree? to be a military lawyer if he was not <coughs> going to be bound by those very important duties because it's inconsistent. I think that's a, a very important um, point and it also is relevant to the defence that his team ran in regard to he was acting in the public interest they talked about. And when we're talking about the paramount legislated duty that lawyers have to the court, that inherent in a lawyer's duty to the court is the duty to the community. It's always understood as that. We have this extra, the legal profession is, as Voltaire has said, it's like a priesthood. You know, it's elevated. We have to remain dispassionate. We have to be very respectful. We cannot mislead the court. As a government lawyer, which McBride was a government lawyer, 
he has extra duties to be a model litigant, which means he must behave perfectly. He must, you know, um, be very objective and dispassionate and um, uphold the law without fear or favour. And that is exactly what he was doing. And that is exactly what has landed him in the dock of the Supreme Court, which should frighten every lawyer in Australia. Well, I suppose so. And I guess what you're saying is that as a barrister, as a legal officer of the court, part of that duty is also to protect the public. Isn't that incorporated? Is that incorporated into this legislation? Is it understood that protecting the nation and a duty towards the nation is actually the whole reason that he has this duty to the court? Well, that's how I've always understood it to be as well, um, because he has a bit of independence in his role as a lawyer because of this legislative duty that he has. It, it's above and beyond. It's paramount. It prevails beyond any other duty. He has that independence. And and that's because, you know, we need to have confidence that our ADF personnel are complying with the rules of war and complying with all of the other rules of engagement that are before them when they are in these operations. And the public has to have confidence that we have lawyers there that have got oversight, independent oversight, to ensure that everyone is upholding those laws. Otherwise, we're just going to have chaos everywhere and people will just be breaking the laws and laws will mean nothing. So he had a very important role in the ADF. And unfortunately, they don't seem to have appreciated the importance of that at all. Well, maybe you can take us back a little bit and tell us what was wrong. A lot of people heard the story about war crimes, but that wasn't exactly it. It was how they were being treated um, from what I understand, there were people in the government and the top brass that were, is that right? They were ignoring some things and prosecuting others. Uh, I've heard the phrase cynical window dressing to make yes. it look like something was being done. Would that, if you explain that to us, do you think that that can possibly give us some clue as to why the age old rule is being broken? Mm. Um, what damage is it actually doing to the courts? Well, to the courts, to democracy, and obviously personally to David McBride and, and his family and everyone that cares for him, there's a lot of damage being done and damage to, I would say, the security of, of Australia, our, our nation's security in regard to his case. It's been damning. But I would say for David McBride, you know, it's been 11 long years for him. And over those 11 years, we have learned and he has learned so much more looking back. We've had the Brereton inquiry. All of the questions that he had have been um, answered, a lot of them in terms of what really happened. But back in the day, at the in 2013 is where it all began for David McBride. And he was just turning up to work, doing his job, which is, you know, a, a desk job, essentially, overseeing investigations, making sure the boxes were being ticked, um, making sure that soldiers were being uh, prosecuted fairly, making sure that procedures and regulations of investigations were being complied with fairly. And that's where things started to unravel. As his role as a legal officer, he was also in a position where people would come to him for advice. And where it all began was he was asked to look at these new amendments to the rules of engagement, which is what you can and cannot do, okay, which is a little bit little bit different to the criminal law in, in our jurisdictions. It, obviously, um, there are lawful killings. You know, you can kill someone and it's not murder as long as it's within these rules of engagement. He was asked to have a look at those rules of engagement because they wanted to change them and they presented him with the changes and he said, why are we changing the rules of engagement? There's, they're fine. In fact, these amendments that you're putting forward are actually going to endanger our soldiers because it's asking them to stop and think of six different things before they can pull the trigger on a Taliban insurgent. And that thought process could result in them being shot. And he said, what was the problem? Why are these being changed? And so they said, well, look, there were these... There were these incidents, you know, three incidents that happened the year before 2012, which we now know were the killing years, the worst killing years. 
And they David said, wasn't employed then. He had and nothing. he wasn't involved in any of those investigations. And they said, oh, there were these incidents the year before and they need to change. And so he said, well, well, what were those incidents? Let me have a look at them. And they wouldn't. And they eventually gave him the three incidents. And they were still under investigation. They hadn't even finalised the investigation. So that was very confusing for him that this was the justification for the rules of engagement, these investigations that hadn't even been completed. And when he looked at the paperwork <laughs> of those investigations, it looked like nothing was wrong, like that the soldiers had complied with the rules of engagement. A year later, after after that, 2014, he's put his complaint in by that stage, they finalised those investigations and cleared all of those people. So, but at the time, he's looking at these unfinished investigations and he said, well, that can't be the reason. What, what, what else? And they said, well, the Australian government solicitor and the Attorney General have provided us legal advice that the rules of engagement must change. And so McBride said, well, let me look at that. Let me look at that legal advice. And they obfuscated, they distracted, um, they gave him a hard time. Eventually, they produced this legal advice. And the legal advice said the rules of engagement did not need to change, that they were fine the way they were. Well, actually, they weren't fine the way they were. In fact, the rules of engagement were actually not consistent with international law. And so the new amendments were definitely not consistent with international law. So the way they were, and probably right now the rules of engagement, they were changed. The amplification of the rules of engagement do not are not consistent with international law. So that was the first thing that David saw that there were lots of questions he had. And so then I think his ears really started pricking up and he started to watch things carefully. And then he started to see that investigations were not following your normal procedure. So even in criminal law here, you know, there must be reasonable suspicion for police to stop and search someone. Um, there must be reasonable suspicion to launch an investigation. And the same is over there in Afghanistan. So there must be reasonable suspicion. Um, you cannot just investigate without that. It's just you'd be investigating everybody and it wouldn't be fair. So this is a threshold. And so someone, it wasn't even his his soldier, someone had investigated um, someone, there was no reasonable suspicion to continue that investigation um, into an unlawful killing. There was an independent witness, which is rare to have. There was an independent witness also, um, and that was a case closed. But all of a sudden, the ADF investigation service that had just started up there, ADFIS, in 2013, 2014, flew over from Australia and intervened in this investigation and decided that they were going to do a fact-finding mission, even though they had no jurisdiction to do that because there was no reasonable suspicion. Firstly, they couldn't get through the front gate because it was the jurisdiction of the officers on the ground who had already determined there was no reasonable suspicion to investigate. But secondly, even if they were able to, there was no reasonable suspicion for them to be able to do that. So they then asked um, uh, Colonel Fogarty, I think it was, uh, for the weapon for this uh, soldier. They wanted his weapon. And so he went to McBride and asked him for some legal advice. Um, should I hand over this weapon? And McBride said, no, you can't hand over any piece of evidence without a warrant. And what is the probative value of the weapon anyway? This soldier admitted to um, shooting this insurgent in circumstances where there was a witness where his life was in danger and it was in self-defense. And he's used his weapon three or four times since then. What's the point of the weapon anyway? But you must have a warrant. Fogarty went back to the edifice and said, no, you need a warrant. Um, there was a to and fro between them. They eventually produced a warrant. The warrant was defective, which is a very bad thing in law. You can't accept a warrant that's defective. It's invalid. It had the wrong offence on it. It was really silly. So McBride said, the warrant is defective. This is the offence you need to be putting on it. Once you correct that, then I can accept the warrant and we can hand over the weapon. They refused. They refused. And then they began to get very heavy on him and on Colonel Fogarty. They threatened them with force. And then um, they started to investigate both of them for obstructing their investigation that had no basis to even begin. Um, and so things were getting really hard for uh, McBride there and um, everything he tried to do was difficult and the more questions he asked, the more he got shut down and, and this is in 2014 when he's starting to compile his complaint and then he found more and more and more incidences where soldiers were being wrongfully prosecuted 
Um, and then he found other situations in other jurisdictions, not Afghanistan, where Australia was not complying with the law whatsoever and entering into operations um, with the US, but without having a good reason and then making up reasons post fact. So he said this was a big problem. It was inconsistent with what the messaging was to Australians, that we were winning this war, that everything was going wonderfully and that we were doing these other operations lawfully and none of that was the case. And so as a lawyer, he had to blow the whistle. I mean, he actually is, he's legis he's, he must do that. He must do that. That is part of being a lawyer. Otherwise, He's committing an offence, concealing an indictable, serious indictable offence, and he could go to jail for that. So he was just actually doing his job, and that's what's got him into so much trouble. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, look, there's a, a couple of things I want to ask you, but first of all, um, is this situation irretrievable? Are there grounds for appeal here at this stage, post-sentencing? And secondly, we heard in court not only about this question of duty, although I think that you've made it a bit clearer today what that actually means, that the public interest is only by default because of the paramount primary duty as a legal officer to the court. But we also heard that because things were going so terribly wrong and David was seeing injustice, I suppose, that he became terribly upset. Well, he developed post-traumatic stress <laughs> syndrome. And I think this was after his second deployment to Afghanistan. So there was a curious argument where it was something that had to be done, but the state that he was in, not seeing justice done properly, that there should be some allowance in his sentencing, that they should be pretty lenient on him. Can you answer both parts of that question? Whether yeah. there's any way that this can be retrieved and what's going to happen to him, basically? Mm. In well, I'll just say straight out, Cathy, that I think he's not guilty and I think he's got strong grounds for an appeal. It might be something that ends up in the High Court I would think um, there are parts of, of his case that probably have never been litigated um, at that level before that might need to, to clear his name and get him justice. Um, all those things will come out along the way. Um, I Can think I just clarify first that um, we don't have the same structure in terms of the courts in Australia as in the UK and in the United States. So the high court is highest, uh, yes. whereas, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we have like the local court, which I call McDonald's, you know, the fast food court, fast and furious, justice and injustice sometimes. And then you, if you're not happy with that, you can appeal to the district court, which is, um, you know, kind of like a, a nice burger bar, you know, and then you've got the Supreme Court, which is like a nice dining restaurant. And then you can appeal to a finer dining restaurant, the Court of Criminal Appeal, and then the High Court, you know, um, which is like, you know, the four-hatted, rest, three-hatted restaurant kind of thing. So that's that's the structure. Um, because his charges are so serious, um, they started off in the Supreme Court. So his next appeal, he must appeal through the chain. He can't just go straight to the High Court, as I understand it he'll have to do the court of appeal first and then he'll do the high court and you have to get leave to be able to appeal in that and this could take years and years and years but on the point of his um, mental health and post-traumatic stress disorder a lot was made of that in court the other day and what wasn't spoken about which I think people need to you know become informed about is what is called moral injury which is something that many veterans suffer it's not just about PTSD from being on the front lines and seeing death and tragedy and their mates dying and children and, and all of those terrible things that they unfortunately see but moral injury is something that I think um, is what McBride had and that was the result of being gaslit um, of being of these cover-ups of him being shot down of him being pretty much told that he's not allowed to make a complaint the psychological warfare on him where he was sent to four three psychologists and one psychiatrist um, who they tried to tell him that he was mad you know like morally I mean I cannot believe knowing his whole story 
that he's actually still living because we know that so many veterans do not survive moral injury and they commit suicide. And that's what's so tragic about this case. And I don't feel like that was really spoken about much in court. What they did talk about is that, yes, he has this PTSD and, yes, he was medicating with alcohol um, because he was coming home so angry because none of his complaints were being taken seriously and he was being gaslit. And that's unfortunately what people often do is they they medicate themselves um, and the, the Commonwealth prosecutor didn't seem to accept that that was a strong factor in his favour, whereas Stephen Odge's senior counsel for McBride was pushing that line because what that means is your moral culpability is deemed to be less than just an average person on the street who isn't experiencing PTSD because you've got your suffering under a, a mental health condition, you're labouring under a mental health condition you're not making the best decisions and it's not all your fault because you've got this condition underlying that is you know contributing to your decision poor decision making um but you know at the end of the day I don't like pathologizing David McBride in that way because I think that this is not about PTSD but you know we are at sentence and his lawyers have to put these things forward they have to address moral culpability so it was very disrespectful I would say of the Commonwealth to really talk that down and I think at one point she said something quite preposterous which was um, rejecting the opinion of uh, the psychologist Mr Bornstein and inviting his honour to accept the opinion of David McBride on his own mental health and I oh, thought yeah. what on earth is that like you don't do that. You know, like you've got an expert, and in court as well, she wanted to reject the expert opinion of the psychologist that David McBride had more than the ordinary person's um, sense of ethical and moral commitment. You know, to Australia and to serving in the ADF, and it was higher than most people. He's a true believer, and and the Crown tried to get that dismissed from court, which was quite ridiculous because. The Commonwealth prosecutor then tried to implant her own opinion as to what level of commitment he had. That is something well within the remit of a psychologist, and that's their expert opinion. So I, I didn't think that went very far. In I, fact, um, I'd say that she even turned his otherwise glowing record of performance mm. and recommendations, endless recommendations mm. for promotion mm. against him. She tried everything. It was very disingenuous and intellectually dishonest. And as a lawyer, I was squirming. I was squirming because um, she's supposed to be a model litigant. She's supposed to be representing all of us. Yes. This is the Commonwealth of Australia. They're meant to be representing us and upholding the law dispassionately and applying it. But I found that her submissions were narrow cast, they were cherry picking, they were unfair, they had a bias on them. Um, yeah, and she was not presenting the case in the way that a model litigant is expected to present. But let's face it, nothing in the case of David McBride has gone the way it should have gone and the odds were stacked against him from the get-go when we had the Attorney General with that superpower that the Attorney General has got to remove evidence from the trial and stick it in a safe that even the judge is not allowed to see. And that is the biggest issue I see in David McBride's case that I think should send chills down everybody's backsides because the judiciary are supposed to be independent for a reason. They are the court of adjudication when there's been an overreach of parliament and the executive in the laws that they introduced and execute. We are supposed to have a safe haven to go to in the court where they can balance out and they can pull back and rectify and administer justice. But when we have evidence that is not permitted to be put in front of the judge, we have the encroachment and the fettering of the independent discretion that the judiciary need in order to make sure we have a balanced and healthy democracy. And I would say there is a need for it to be independent as well. You mentioned before that we worked with the United States and at one point during the week-long hearings, there was a King's Council who came in 
and and started talking about the need to remove evidence because it could be damaging to our foreign partners. So how much has this got to do with the United States? I don't think we're working with the United States. I think we're working for the United States, Australia. I think we're bending over for Uncle Sam, left, right and centre, and that's the concern there. And I think that was one of the reasons why so much of the evidence was kept in a safe and, and kept from the public because we know it did touch on other jurisdictions and it did touch on Australia entering into operations with the US without asking any questions. And you can't do that. Uh, And then, you know, working out, oh, we better make up a reason as to why we're going into Syria for this particular operation, because we've just gone in there anyway, because the US have asked us to. That's what they didn't want to. That's what they didn't want to expose. That's what they didn't want want coming out. That's Mm. what they're protecting. I don't think that that is highly classified information. I think that that is information that we, the public, should know about because I do not want our government entering into operations in other countries just on the say-so of the US and then cobbling together some kind of reason for it later. I mean, that's very frightening. And the way David McBride's case has gone has been... You know, it has been a very, very fine illustration um, of our democracy crumbling and shows us exactly who is in control now and who owns Australia. We do not own Australia. America owns Australia. And that is why the Americans are so interested in this case. Uh, And that is why the Americans are so interested in Julian Assange and extraditing him and shutting him down. and American by friends. By <laughs> death by a thousand cuts, you know. Um, yeah. it's, it's just time for us to start getting this information out to the mainstream. And it's been very, very unfortunate that the mainstream media have been absent in the case of David McBride. Where yeah. were they on sentence day? All of that evidence that was coming out that was just so astounding all of the evidence that threatens our democracy that was coming out, but yet there was barely any reporting besides you and I. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and that's the fourth estate, you know, that's the fourth estate. And they are in bed with the government on yeah. that. They don't want to report anything adverse to the government because they will then stop getting the inside information that they get to run the headlines that they get so they can win their Walkley Awards. And I think that's been a very frightening experience for David McBride because, of course, the the whole case rests on the fact that he went to journalists, investigative journalists, because he thought they would actually be interested and they would actually investigate the biggest story here, the systemic issues with the way Australia is unlawfully operating, not just in Afghanistan but over in other jurisdictions. But... All we saw was some cherry picking of some low hanging fruit and a bad soldier story. And then when this narrative that has just been focused on David McBride is, oh, he didn't care about war crimes. He was covering up war crimes because he only cared about the over investigation of soldiers. This binary narrative that has been created by the media and the Commonwealth in terms of what evidence they've allowed in and out has allowed them to do that. Um, has been very disappointing, Um, but we will get the full story out there, Cathy, even if it's just you and I doing it. We won't stop (laughs) stop reporting um, uh, out there because because we must hold the media to account in this. They have, especially the ABC, they sign up to a statement of ethics where they must report matters that are in the public interest objectively (laughs) and dispassionately. And there's been a great failure of that in David McBride's case. Everyone has just run away. They've grabbed their Walkleys and they've gone out, stage exit left. Well, yes, we're undeterred. Now, speaking of deterrence, Mm -hmm. um, in terms of sentencing, there was a lot of talk about deterrence and the relationship between culpability and deterrence as well. In relation to David's PTSD, Stephen Odgers argued that he was less culpable and therefore 
should not be so heavily punished. Now, what we've got is the prosecution asking for a prison term, and they're saying that two years non-parole period isn't enough. Mm. And what Odgers is saying, and actually what Justice David Mossop asked for, an inquiry at the end of the week of hearings, mm. he asked about what's called an intensive correction order. Now I shuddered when I heard that term. I thought he's going to be tortured. Um, but that's, uh, you know, it's not that at all. I went and looked it up. And basically what it is, is some restriction on David's movement, monitoring, I guess, and counselling. And we heard from Odgers that David wouldn't be against engaging in counselling sessions. I'd like to be a fly on the wall there. Um, that might be fun. Um, but that would be appropriate, said the defence, for a period of up to four years. I think our American audience would probably understand that like as somewhat akin to house arrest. What do you think might happen in view of the fact that Judge Mossop was thinking along those lines of monitoring, counselling, and that can be done for up to a period of four years? <clears throat> will he go ahead with that or mm. will he take heed of what the prosecution wants, which is a quite a harsh punishment, mm. a minimum of two years non-parole period for David McBride. Well, it, this is what's going to be very interesting on the day because um, it was Judge Mossop himself that ordered an ICO intensive corrections order assessment to be done on David. And that is the judge, Judge Mossop, who sat there in all the pre-trial arguments, who listened and heard all of the evidence except for the evidence that was in the safe that no one can see or hear about. Um, and it was in his opinion that David's offending falls within the remit of an ICO. And so that's fantastic news. That means, because this happens in court every day, I'm in court and the judge orders an ICO, Unless you fail your ICO, you're pretty much going to get an ICO. You're going to get an intensive corrections order. Now, an intensive corrections order is like a good behaviour bond, but a very serious one. It's actually a term of imprisonment served in the community. It's not no light thing. And I think, obviously, I think a lot of things, I don't think he should be given anything at all. Um, but it's a very serious term of imprisonment. And it does restrict his freedom of movement significantly. He cannot leave Canberra. He has to ask permission to do anything. He's only allowed to leave the state for a funeral or something very extreme like that. So he's going to, his daughter is in school in Sydney. So that's going to be very difficult. There was all this, what we call extracurial punishment as well, Kathy, that wasn't really talked about a lot, but I'm sure it was within the submissions that were written that were handed up. But I thought after the intensive corrections order was ordered, and we know that he passed that with flying colours, He's going to get an ICO. And what could possibly change that? So we arrive at the sentencing hearing last week and the Crown are making these submissions, which I didn't think really had a lot of weight. The judge was provided with some extra material, subjective material, the, the psychological report done for David McBride. And there are a couple of cases, authorities, of people who have been subjected to this particular offence and what penalties they got but in David's case there's been nothing like it <laughs> um, so it was very difficult for either party to submit on what would be the appropriate penalty by comparing to previous cases which is what you normally do you hand up a case you say well this person did this it was worse or less therefore your honor should fall into this area there is nothing really comparable to this so it's a very difficult sentencing exercise for Judge Mossop but he knew that back last year when he was ordering an assessment for David to be assessed for an ICO. So why would that change? That's the question that I'm going to have if it does change into a full-time custodial sentence because all the court has now is submissions. They're just words coming out of the mouth custody if there was some actual evidence that what he did has caused harm. And all we heard on the day was hypotheticals that no harm, there was no evidence of harm caused, but there was a risk that harm could have been caused. And at one point, the Commonwealth prosecutor wanted um, his honour to accept 
And that is the only thing that could make the sentence go from an ICO to a full-time term of custody if there was some actual evidence that what he did has caused harm. And all we heard on the day was hypotheticals, that no harm, there was no evidence of harm caused, but there was a risk that harm could have been caused. And at one point the Commonwealth prosecutor wanted um, his honour to accept that just by the nature of the documents, just by the fact that they were so sensitive, that's how his honour could conclude that there was serious harm and therefore give him a full-time custodial term of around four years. And that, to me, if his honour does conclude that, and if that is in a written judgment, well, I would say that he's erred in law and I would say that that would be an appeal point because we know, um, Cathy, that there was no evidence whatsoever of any harm done except there was one submission by the Crown that said that she said, we had to tell an ally that the documents had been taken. But there was no evidence that those documents had ever led to any harm, maybe a little bit of embarrassment for people and humiliation, but there was no harm to our national security or anything like that. So when the Crown was submitting on the stealing charge, because he's got the stealing charge and then he's got the giving the documents to the journalist charges on the stealing charge. The Crown was submitting that just the stealing, there was a risk attached to that, okay? But there was no evidence, they said, that anything else had happened with the fact that he'd stolen them. And I think at one point the Crown said he had copied them and he had moved them around. Um, so we didn't even bother investigating, you know, whether or not, you know, it, it, anything else happened with those. But what the most stunning and astounding submission of the day was the Crown trying to conclude that it was so serious and the, the documents were so highly sensitive and they were so highly classified that even though they didn't see the light of day except in the Afghan files, there was nothing else that came out about all of the other documents about Syria and other jurisdictions. Just the fact that those documents were so highly sensitive was enough for his honour to conclude that, you know, he should practically get the death penalty. But the massive concession that the Crown made was that, the ADF had taken no action, no steps, no investigation to see if any of those documents have been accessed by anyone else besides those journalists. There's no evidence that they had, and the AFP hadn't even done any investigations. And in regards to the material that David published on the website, they said that there was no, there was very, very little risk that there was any prejudice there to national security or anything there. So didn't they also say that um, when he was instructed to remove that material from the website, that he did so immediately as he well? Did, he did so right. immediately. Yeah, he did so immediately. But still, there there's no evidence that any of that material was used in any way that has put our national security at risk. And they were concessions made by the Crown. So... Yeah. I'm wondering how his honour can actually sentence him to full-time custody without falling into okay. it. It's a very similar in a way to arguments made in the Julian Assange case. And it's been like that since 2011, where they've, uh, you know, WikiLeaks has got blood on their hands. You know, it's all about this hypothetical blood as something of a distraction from the, the real blood, blood. Actually, the blood that is actually on the hands of the, of the people. I know. And if we are to believe that um, the seriousness of the offending can be gauged by the sensitivity of the documents that you're not oh. allowed to know anything about. I mean, God, you're right. you know, we're not children. Yeah, yeah and, well, um, well, that's how we get treated. And, and the problem that we've got, Kathy, is here you and I are talking, where's the rest of Australia? You know, they're not hearing all of this because the mainstream media is not publishing it, you know, and 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 that's just absolutely they're frightening. They're deterred. They've been deterred. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that that's what's absolutely frightening. And and when it comes down to deciding what punishment um, David McBride should get, you know, let's not forget that he has been, you know, this lonely warrior of truth for 11 years now. Yeah. And since he was charged, he's been on bail. 
He's had to give up his phone number to police. So they always know what, always listening to his phone. He's had to um, have this hanging over his head. His girls now, you know, one is in her early 20s and the other one is still in high school. They've grown up with this since they were little. Yeah. You know, it, it has been a very, very difficult, challenging, yeah. onerous time for David McBride. And I would say he has suffered enough. He has suffered enough. Yes, and uh, obviously emptied his pockets as well. So, I yes. mean, it's, the, you know, he's being bled in a number of ways. In every way. Well, look, um, thank you so much, Eddie, for going through all this with us. And as they say, I'll see you in court. I can't wait to see you again. Your tweets are amazing. So thank you for all the coverage you too. What you're doing. <laughs> it's just incredible, you know, very, very good to have your take on things as a non-lawyer I'm just astounded at how quickly you get across the issues and um, are, are able to you know translate them into layman's terms for people to see our job now is to get this information into the wider community absolutely well thank you so much oh just before you go can you tell people how to reach you like you have a law practice and also you have a handle um online. And tell yeah. us tell us a bit about eddie lloyd before you go oh okay well i'm a lawyer i'm uh, an accredited specialist uh, criminal lawyer i have been a trial advocate which is kind of like a barrister in the past for the aboriginal legal service i've been a politician i've been a councillor on the local council here for about five and a half years no longer there that was a fixed prison term that i never want to revisit and um, I do a lot of tweeting and my tweet handle is at worlds on fire with a Z, W-O-R-L-D-Z um, on fire. And that's the best way people can contact me. I'm not really active on the other social media forums, but I'm pretty active on Twitter. I still call it Twitter anyway, and I'm not going anywhere, Elon. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, uh, so it's going to be a short one on Tuesday there was already a whole day of arguments that were heard in relation to sentencing so it could be as little as half an hour it starts at 9 30 is that right 9 30 I'd say it'll go for an hour and a half if I an hour and a half I think it'll take us to morning tea um, yeah because you know they'll yeah they they yeah I think it'll probably take an hour and a half it's it's not a it's not a fast judgment I mean we've just had an entire day of of sentencing, hearing and submissions. It's not like the local court where you're on your feet for five minutes and it's done and dusted and your client's out the door or downstairs yeah. in the cells as it may be. He's going to be giving a very considered judgment. He's going to try to make sure that he has dotted the I's and crossed the T's and make it as tight as possible so it can't be appealed. Yes. But yeah, we will see and we will tweet and we will talk on the day, Cathy. Yes, folks, uh, so... Tune in to Consortium News actually from 8.30 a.m. Australian time because there's going to be a press conference outside and we'll probably start tweeting then. And then court, as soon as it's in session, follow Worlds on Fire. Uh, that is Eddie and she certainly is on fire. And Consortium News. And, and Consortium. Um, yeah, yeah, we can guarantee you. All bases uh, covered. Uh, <laughs> We've got all bases covered, you and I. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the journalist and the lawyer reporting. Yeah. And you'll find those threads quite complimentary. Yes. Well, thank you once again for speaking to us. And I'll see you on Tuesday. Pleasure. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. Bye.